welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll learn how to simulate a many particle system using molecular dynamics. We'll be simulating a gas using a classic potential called the Leonard Jones potential to describe the interaction between a pair of gas molecules. This potential has a repulsive core so that two molecules can't coexist in the same space, and it has a minimum at R min. The Leonard Jones potential looks like this. The repulsive term goes like 1 over R to the 12th, which gives us a really sharp divergence here. It also has an attractive part that goes like 1 over R to the 6th, and that's responsible for the minimum at R min. This is a model for the van der Waals interaction. We can calculate the force coming from this potential by taking minus its gradient. Here, we've aligned the center to center vector between two particles along the x-axis. In the x direction, we get a force that's 12x over r times r min times epsilon, which is the scale of our interaction, times r over r min to the 13th minus an attractive piece that goes like r min over r to the 7th. Here's an example of a Leonard Jones simulation between two particles interacting with one another. They collide in an elastic collision, which means they must conserve both energy and momentum. In a standard Leonard Jones simulation, we have many particles in our system and each pair of particles interacts via a Leonard Jones potential. This means that the energy depends on the position of all of the particles at a given instant in time, and we can calculate the net force acting on any given particle at that instant. So what we want to do in our simulation is take that force and integrate it to find new positions for all of the particles as a function of time. Then we recalculate the energy and forces and repeat. The first thing we have to do to run a simulation is to set up our system. We need to pick how many particles we want to simulate. We need to pick an initial condition for them, an energy scale or a temperature scale, and the size of our time steps. This last point is really important because when I integrate my position, I want to take steps that are small compared with the force acting on me. Otherwise, I might move so far away that the local environment won't be valid anymore then I need to solve Newton's equations for each particle. The acceleration of each particle is given by the net forces acting on it by interactions with all other particles, divided by m, and then I repeat this at every time step. After the simulation reaches equilibrium, we can start measuring physically relevant quantities. For example, the mean squared displacement, effective temperature, or total energy. And we'll be talking later about all three of these. For simulations like these, it's important to pick random initial conditions and try to get the statistics to repeat over and over over several simulations. So one way to pick initial positions is to use a flat distribution. Imagine our simulation box has bounds at x min and x max. That means that there's an equal probability for a particle to be at any position within these bounds. In Mathematica, we can use the function random real to pick the position of particles. We can also use a seed for the pseudo random number generator if we want the initial condition to be the same between runs. Next, we'll need to choose the initial speed of our particles. Since this is a simulation of an ideal gas, we'll be drawing those from the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. The width of this distribution is given by sigma, and sigma is one-third of the average squared speed. The Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution in physics relates the energy scale coming from the temperature, or kT, to the average kinetic energy, or one-half mv squared, of the system. This means that the average temperature in the system is equal to its average kinetic energy. This is called the kinetic theory definition of temperature. Picking velocities from this distribution will statistically give us a system with a fixed average kinetic energy. This is related to the temperature of the system such that the average squared velocity is equal to 3 halves kT. There are several potential algorithms we can use to integrate this system. However, the one we'll be using today is called velocity verlet. This is a way of discreetly updating the positions of all particles based on their velocity and the force acting on them at any given time step. We'll start by expanding the trajectory of a particle as a function of t at time t plus delta t. The first term is just its position at time t, plus the velocity at time t times delta t, plus one half its force divided by mass times delta t squared, plus higher order terms. First, we'll write down a couple of identities that we'll use throughout the integration. 
We'll begin by isolating the velocity term by combining the expressions r of t plus delta t and r of t minus delta t. Their difference gives me twice the velocity as a function of t times delta t. This gives me the definition of a discrete derivative, r of t plus delta t minus r of t minus delta t divided by 2 times delta t is equal to the discrete derivative of r, or the velocity at time t. The sum of these two terms removes the velocity term and relates the position at time t to the force at time t. Before we start our integration algorithm, we need to do an initialization step. First, calculate all of the initial positions, all of the initial velocities, and the initial force acting on each particle. The point of velocity verle is to keep the total energy fixed at each time step. To do this, we'll split the velocity update into two halves. This makes the integration step slightly more stable to larger step sizes, but we still do want to be careful because a time step that's too big can still change the kinetic energy. So this is our algorithm. Step one, we're going to calculate all of the half-step velocities. I do this by a discrete integration of the force with time step delta t over 2, so that the velocity halfway through the integration step, vn plus a half, is equal to vn plus fn divided by 2m times delta t. Step two, we're going to update all of the positions based on this half-step velocity. So the new position, rn plus 1, is our old position, rn, plus the half-step velocity times delta t. Step 3, we're going to calculate the forces acting on all of the particles from the new positions we just worked out in step 2. And lastly, we're going to update all of the velocities at the end of the time step. And I'll do this exactly the way I calculated the half step velocity. So my velocity at time step n plus 1 is equal to my velocity at time step n plus a half plus fn over m times delta t over 2. The full simulation takes this integration step and iterates it over and over. This type of simulation is called molecular dynamics. The last thing we should discuss before running our simulation is the boundary conditions. There are lots of different types of boundary conditions we can use. One thing we can do is have purely repulsive walls. In order to implement this, we need a nice smooth function that we can integrate. We often use a modified version of the Leonard-Jones potential that keeps only the repulsive part, just the 1 over r to the 12th piece. Then we can place a test particle near the wall and calculate the energy at that point. I do this by integrating the interaction between my particle and an infinitesimal wall segment. First, we can calculate the distance between them, r, in terms of x and y. My interaction energy is then epsilon times r min to the 12th times the integral from minus infinity to infinity of dy divided by r to the 12th, which is x squared plus y squared to the 6th. This integral gives me 63 pi over 256 times epsilon r min to the 12th divided by x to the 11th. For a square box, I take this potential energy and apply it to walls on the left and right, on the top, and on the bottom. Another type of boundary condition that physicists use a lot are periodic boundary conditions. Our simulation box is everything inside this green rectangle here, but our goal is to simulate an infinite system without boundaries. To do this, we can create an extended local environment that's made up of eight identical copies of our simulation box. As our particle moves, it feels forces coming from the duplicate particles in the other boxes as well as in the original box. When the particle moves, we're going to teleport it so that it lives inside the simulation box at all times. Note that the particle and all of its images move along the same trajectory. So I'm going to replay this animation, but what I want you to focus on is what happens when this particle passes through the right side of the box and teleports over to the left side at the same height. As soon as it passes the right, it teleports over to the left and continues on as if nothing happened. If we want to run a simulation with periodic boundary conditions, we need to change two things from our initial simulation setup. First, we need to calculate the potential coming from all of the neighboring boxes. And then we need to update the trajectory of the system so that when a particle leaves the simulation box from one side, it gets teleported back inside. Now that we've successfully run a molecular dynamic simulation, we can look at what happens with the physics. 
This is a video of a molecular dynamics simulation done by Jacob Earnshaw when he was a PhD student at Sheffield Hallam University. He's looking at how these long chain hydrocarbon molecules behave when they're in a glass. In the glass phase, which is the movie on the left, there are lots of identical molecules all pushed up against one another. They're packed in tightly enough that it restricts the motion of each individual molecule, confining it to a fixed space. You can see that throughout the simulation, the backbone of this molecule doesn't really change. This can be compared to the higher temperature fluid state on the right, where the higher temperature means that each molecule has more kinetic energy to explore its surroundings. And with higher kinetic energy, the molecules can move together to escape any effects of caging or confinement. You can see that this molecule is much more able to explore its full configuration space. For our Leonard Jones gas, we'll be measuring a quantity called mean squared displacement, which is the average of the squared distance from the initial position to the position as a function of time. This average is taken over all of the particles at the system and at different starting times. At short times, we can basically turn off the interactions so the particles can move freely according to their velocities. They move the same way they would in free space. This is called ballistic motion. This means that position changes according to t times the velocity. So the mean squared displacement scales like time squared. This corresponds to the slope of 2 on this log log plot. At longer times, however, the particles start to feel the interactions with one another. This happens through collisions with other particles. When one particle gets close to another particle, they bounce off one another. In each of these collisions, momentum is conserved. These collisions can come from any direction. This means that an incoming particle has an equal probability of being scattered in any direction. In this regime, the mean square displacement of the particles scales like time. It turns out that what we found here is that adding interactions to a gas of particles gives rise to diffusion. A mean square displacement that scales with time is exactly the law of diffusion. Or said in another way, it takes four times as long for a diffusive particle to make it an average of twice the distance. In the next video, we'll be switching gears and looking at the calculus of variations, which is the mathematical basis for Lagrangian mechanics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.